Hello everyone, <laughs> welcome to Art History or HIS 201. I'm going to start this lecture for the three PowerPoints for the first week that we will go over and I'll start to record them I think each week um, but also we will do these live in class as well. So the first chapter is prehistory as you can see. Um, so we'll go over some of the art, important art details, art history stuff. Um, and of course the artworks themselves as we go through it. So you do have access to these PowerPoints, and so I will go through them fairly quickly, only stopping at some key things and key areas. So generally when we're talking about prehistory, for the most part we're dealing with um, Europe um, and the Near East, which today we would call the Middle East. You can see on the map the little dots where all the key sites are. But Okay, so again, I'm not going to read all this stuff. This is stuff the goals of this particular week, uh, this particular PowerPoint. Um, but more importantly, get to use to some things that we're going to see. So um, most books um, used to use BC and AD, but that has changed to BCE and CE, but the year hasn't changed. So technically it's 2020 AD or 2020 CE. Something happened 400 BC or happened 400 BCE. But just so you can kind of get used to the changes um, that have happened. So I do have a lot of dates, and you will see a lot of dates as we go through this, but they aren't important unless I tell you they're important. There are very few dates that you should have to remember. I think three for the whole year, the whole semester. But I have them so you kind of know what happened in what order. So very quickly, in order for us to become art creators, things had to happen in our evolution that made us into artists. So the first big step in evolution is the first hominids, human-like, that's what hominid means, uh, to walk on two feet, really important in the steps of creating art. Obviously the next huge step would be Homo habilis, the ability to make tools. So Homo habilis is Latin for Homo is man, habilis is handy, good with his hands, right? And the reason that particular skeleton is different than the ones that came before is because it has an opposable thumb, right? Thumb that goes in the different direction. So Anciently, the thumb would be here the same way, all the fingers going in the same direction. Good for grabbing stuff, not good for making tools, not good for using tools. Try to do a hammer with just your four fingers or a screwdriver, or for that matter, throw a curveball, right? You need your thumb. So that's a huge step in evolution, tool making, and the opposable thumb. The next big step in evolution takes almost two million more years, and that's the first modern humans, the ones that kind of would look no different than us maybe maybe have a little bit more hair uh, and that's homo sapien those first appeared in africa of course again now you have a bigger uh, brain capacity now you have tool making ability and now we assume that there's some advanced reasoning going on we don't know for sure it's prehistory um but about a hundred thousand years ago they started to bury the dead prior to that dead were just left out you died, people kept walking, you know, goodbye, Grandpa, as you walked by him. Um, so we know that, that something changed dramatically 100,000 years ago to think that we need to bury people. So the assumption, again, assumption, prehistory means there's no written record, is that some kind of religious practices developed around that time because you have a set series of tons of burials um, throughout the world, um, wherever there are different versions of homo sapiens which is also something i guess i should bring up real quick they're not one kind of homo sapien so that's why i said they weren't quite like us there are homo sapiens there are homo sapien neanderthal there are homo sapien cro magnon homo sapien there's about five different kinds of humans living at the same time so despite that weird uh, movies of cavemen and whatever and there's a, there were several different kinds and they appeared in several different places um, on the earth and they looked the same and they all were homo sapiens so you could interbreed um, but they weren't modern modern humans which are homo sapiens sapien right but they all coexisted at the same time uh, eventually the four other kinds went extinct either through war through interbreeding there's a bunch of different um, reasons and then really next big important step obviously and be able to create art and create things is obviously development of language how do we know that well the, the skeletal remains have the first vocal cords. 
So it wasn't that ancient humans couldn't make sounds. They could, but they couldn't make speech. They couldn't do full range of motion, full range of sounds, right? So you could grunt at each other, basically, prior to this. Okay, the next big steps are for us, finally, in art history. And that is about 40,000 years ago, 42,000 years ago, the first kind of artworks appear, um, right? So those are small, you know, one, two inch portable figures, sometimes made of stone, sometimes actually made of animal bone that were sculpted into the shapes of animals or humans, etc. So the first works of art ever created, definitely a test question, um, were sculptures. And again, we're talking about there's four or five different kinds of human beings. The last of those other kinds of human beings that weren't us um, or weren't would become us were Neanderthal. And those went extinct um, about 12,000 years ago. So by, by about 10,000 BC, the last of our other human rivals disappeared. Now, those ones we know we bred with. Uh, we know, obviously, we also probably killed a lot of them. But we also bred with them because, thanks to DNA, when they mapped out the human DNA, They've found that some humans, not all, but some humans actually have some DNA of Neanderthal in them. Um, so again, big step for us. About 30,000 years ago, the first cave paintings, first known cave paintings appear in Chauvet in France. Then the other two big cave painting sites in Europe, Lascaux and Altamira, about 15, 17,000 years ago. Um, these are the three big ones. Again, it's usually a test question, just so you know, where are the three big cave painting sites. Importantly for the future, probably of all of all humans, right, is the domestication of animals. We figured out if we put a fence around cows, a fence around pigs, a fence around chickens, they couldn't get away and we'd have a constant source of food rather than chasing them around wherever they migrate to, we'd have to migrate with them. So that's another thing that I guess is really important to kind of know. We weren't really cavemen, despite all the movies, um, even though there are paintings in caves. Um, we may have stayed in caves while the animals were around, but the minute the animals moved, so did we. So most of the time, humans were just moving. They were nomads, constantly moving. Wherever the animals went, we followed where they went, right? Sometimes hundreds of miles um, every year, sometimes thousands of miles every year. Um, so the big, huge difference is building those fences means you don't have to f travel as much. And then about a thousand years after that, not only do they figure out how to keep animals, they also figured out how to plant and grow food. So the agricultural revolution or the Neolithic agricultural revolution, as it's better known, happens about 10,000 years ago. And it happens in three or four different places, you know, close to the same time period. So it wasn't just one place that figured out how to grow crops. You know, three or four different places in, in major river valleys throughout the world. And they have those. I'm pretty sure I have those. Now. So again, dates aren't really important yet. I'll tell you when they are. But test questions do come from these things, which is why I do them. Obviously, in order to create art, you have to create cities. You have to create things. The world's oldest city, continuously inhabited. Let's be careful here because there's two different questions. Oldest inhabited, oldest continuously inhabited is Jericho. So what does that mean? What's the difference? That means somebody has lived in Jericho for the past 11,000 years. Not the same person, obviously. My mother-in-law is old, but not that old. But some people have lived in Jericho for the past 11,000 years. There are cities that are older than Jericho, but they were destroyed. Um, so when I ask oldest city in the world, that's different than oldest continuously inhabited city in the world. So obviously, if you create food, you need a place to store it. So pottery develops to store the food. And then, of course, what's really important to the prehistoric period is the end of prehistory, which is the development of writing. So that happens about 5,300 years ago. The earliest writing develops in a place called Mesopotamia, which today is mostly Iraq and Kuwait. Um, the area in Mesopotamia where this happened is Sumer, which is in the southern part of Iraq and parts of Kuwait, actually. Um, <clears throat> that moment technically ends the prehistoric period and brings begins the historical period. So the difference between prehistory and history is just writing. Now, again, it wasn't like 3301 BCE, nobody was writing on New Year's Eve. You know, somebody got drunk and figured out how to write in 3300 BCE, we could write. These are rough approximate dates. By, by 3300 BCE, writing had developed into a skill 
and writing had developed into something important and people started using writing more and more often. Now, it was only in Mesopotamia, so other places in the world were still technically in prehistoric periods, right? So sometimes it's hard, but we consider this to be the official end. The same thing happens. We consider 2300 BCE, you see here at the bottom, to be the end of the Stone Age and the beginning of the Bronze Age, although the Bronze Age started you know, 700 years before in Mesopotamia, it hasn't like reached the rest of the world by 20 till, till another 700 years. So what's the difference between Bronze Age, Stone Age, Copper Age, etc. and so on? All those ages are just based upon what, what are the major tools and weapons being used in that period. So during the Stone Age, all of the major tools and weapons were made from stone. And then in the Bronze Age, all of the major tools and weapons are made from bronze. Copper Age, Copper, Iron Age, Iron, etc. We could go on, right? In case you're wondering what age you live in today, it's the Information Technology Age. All of our tools and weapons are based upon information technology. So prehistory, fortunately for us, can be divided into three neat little periods. Uh, again, the dates aren't, aren't important. They're there so you know what they are, but they're not important. What's important is that you know the three different eras and what they are. Right, so Paleolithic, Mesolithic, Neolithic, which are Greek words. And if we translated those Greek words into English, although we use Paleolithic, Mesolithic, and Neolithic in English, we also use Old Stone Age, Middle Stone Age, and New Stone Age, right? So we use both of these words, Paleolithic and Old Stone Age, for the same thing. So <clears throat> Paleolithic Age is basically hunters and gatherers, no permanent sets of dwellings, nomads following wherever the animals went. By the Mesolithic period, we figured out how to round up certain animals into certain areas and how to fish. Um, so you have some small sediments starting. And then, of course, by the Neolithic age, you have agriculture and full-blown sediments, settlements, villages, cities, eventually civilizations, empires, right? Um, so each period is going to have characteristics. Sorry. Each period of art is going to have characteristics. You need to know two for each test, whichever two works for you. So in the Paleolithic period, there are four, but whichever two are best for you to remember uh, uh, will work for you. Um, so in the Paleolithic period, because the only thing that mattered, remember hunters, gatherers, following food, the only thing that mattered was food and sources of food. All the artwork is going to kind of relate to that. So the artwork is going to tend to be realistic rather than abstract. So what does that mean? Realistic doesn't mean it's good. A lot of people get confused and think realistic means it looks just like real life. That's realism. That's different. Realistic means you tried to make it look like it really looks. So if I asked everyone in the class to draw me a picture of a lion, no matter how awful of a drawer you are, your version of a lion would be a realistic version. You try to make it look like a lion. Unless... You decided to do a circle, a square, a rectangle, and a triangle, and said, "That's my lion." Then that would be abstract, right? Um, you're not you're representing a lion rather than having a lion. So in the Paleolithic period, that wasn't important. They wanted it to look like it really looked because they were trying to teach people about them, whether this is what we eat or this is what we're afraid of or whatever the case may be. Um, the sculptures that do exist from the Paleolithic period are small and portable because you carry them around with you. Humans are almost never shown because humans don't matter yet. But I mean, they matter to each other. But they're more interested in food and eating and animals than people. So the focus is on the natural world and not the spiritual world. Again, for that same reason. I'm going to skip through some of these. Like I said, it doesn't mean they won't show up on a test. But it, I'm just going to stop at the really important ones. So again, these these are up there for you. So... The really first really important one is the Venus of Willendorf, which until recently was the oldest human figure ever discovered. They've actually discovered some that are older now, about 40,000 years B.C. rather than 28,000. But for a long time, this was the oldest work of art depicting a human figure. Clearly, this is a woman. Clearly, it's a fertility symbol. Um, the large breast, the large stomach, uh, the large thighs, the large genital area, um, the insignificant size of the hands and arms, as you can kind of see, the insignificant, you know, no face, no feet, not important. None of that's important to childbirth, but you need breasts to feed. Your stomach needs to expand to give birth. Your thighs and your vag uh, vagina need to be large because the baby has to come out and survive. Again, anciently, not modernly, 
Anciently, two out of every three childbirths ended in death, either of the baby of the, or of the mother or sometimes of both. So it was miraculous if anyone survived, number one. And number two, um, it was really important to not be frail, basically. So no, they didn't worship fat people back then, which I get a lot of times with this. What this is is a fertility symbol. Nobody got fat back then. Trust me, every day everybody was hungry. Um, you weren't eating every single day even enough to get fat. And then you were walking one to two to three hundred miles following animals around. Um, so this is more like, more than likely a goddess symbol. It's small, by the way. It's only about four inches. Only about four inches. Um, and there are several of them. This is not the only one. There are several of these that have been discovered uh, in caves. So the assumption, and this is an assumption because it's prehistory, is maybe it was a good luck charm for when you got pregnant. Maybe this was a goddess you prayed to for when you got pregnant, right? Um, but those are guesses. I um, can't tell you they're true, but as you can see, she does appear again and again and again throughout the cave, the Paleolithic period. Here's some buffalo, some more buffalo. So I think what's really important, I'm not going to read all of this again, like I told you, but you need to know all of this because I know that this is a question and later there's an essay um, that involves this. So people didn't live in the backs of caves. People lived in the front of caves, obviously. But all of those paintings that you see and you will see in cave paintings are way deep in the back of caves. So they weren't meant for everyone to see. That we know. Many of them have been nicked uh, by like someone throwing their arrow or spear at the picture. Um, almost all of the pictures are of animals. Again, Paleolithic period. Um, they're painted one on top of each other. So that means they probably didn't see the one underneath. That's how dark it was. And probably over different time periods of cycling back, following the animals back to, because animals do come back to the same spots, right? Um, again, like I said, the most three famous are Chauvet, Lascaux, and Altamira. I know I ask that as well. So I think that's pretty important that you know that. Um, so I do want you to know that the cave paintings are not right there. So here's one of the most famous ones, which is Chauvet. It's the oldest known full-scale cave painting. There's, this is not all of it that you see in this picture. By the way, it's much, much, much bigger than this. Um, this is just one of the many walls. And actually, each wall is a little bit different. So this wall has kind of like rhinos, bears, lions. The other wall has deer, antelope, uh, water buffalo, and buffalo. So it's kind of like this is the wall that's dangerous. This is the, the other wall is the wall that we hunt. right? So lions, bears, uh, rhinos are going to kill us, and you can't eat them. But antelope, buffalo, right, you can. So there's some big guesses that the reason for these paintings was to teach hunters. Um, there's also some that it was for educational purposes. There's also some that it was religious because, as I said before, some of the paintings are actually thrown arrows or thrown spears at them. Perhaps maybe some magical thing. If I hit my spear, hits the antelope when I go hunting, I'm imbued with the magic power of catching the deer on the wall um, again. It's prehistory. We don't know for sure. But those are the two big guesses. These are just some of the other cave paintings, so you can kind of see the difference. The next big one is in, is in Altamira in Spain with the wounded buffalo. Uh, and then the next big one is in Lascaux in France. And I know this looks modern, and that's because it is. They added a sidewalk in there, so you, when you go to see the cave paintings. Unfortunately, uh, they're not generally open to the public anymore. You can get special permission. It's not that easy, but you can. They're generally not open to the public anymore because um, they're deteriorating. Because generally maybe 20 or 30 people lived in here for maybe four or five weeks out of a year. Um, and then when they opened it up to the public to visit, it ended up being a big tourist site. And they were having five, six, seven thousand 7,000 people a day. And the paint started to come off the walls. And not because people were doing it, but basically because of the carbon dioxide that comes off of your breath. And it... Um, damage the walls. This is just different ones. Okay, so Neolithic art, there is no Mesolithic art per se. There is, but there's no different characteristics, so we kind of skip it. It's basically the opposite of Neolithic. So in, rather than realistic, it's abstract. So it doesn't have to be realistic anymore because now you have permanent food in the backyard. You don't have to explain to people what the good animals are. Um, obviously, you have a backyard and you have houses, so architecture develops. And you have food, so food... 
it has to be put in plates and cups so art for utilitarian purposes develops so rather than just being artistic or having some kind of external value it's like this is a cup i need to make a cup it's art still even though we don't kind of think of cups and plates as art humans become important and that's basically because the shift completely changes from worrying about nature and worrying about eating to having so much free time on your hands and it used to take you all day long from 6 a.m to 7 p.m hunting hoping you'd catch as many animals as possible or gathering gathering berries off of bushes getting enough food for the whole tribe to you wake up in the morning, you go in the backyard, you milk the cow, you get some eggs, you kill a pig, you have breakfast, lunch, and dinner. It took you maybe two hours instead of 12, so you had 10 free hours on your time, on your hands. And what happens when people have time on their hands, and you guys can answer this yourselves and know that it's true, because although very rarely do you have times on your hand, but if you remember when Hurricane Maria, I want to say, a couple of years ago, and all the cell phone towers went down, even though it wasn't that bad of a hurricane, but we had one or two days where cell phones weren't working. Um, you had a lot of free time on your hands. So if you can think back on that time, when you had a lot of free time on your hands and you couldn't access your cell phone and you couldn't access the internet, um, what did you think about? You tend to think about the bigger questions in life. You get philosophical a little bit. Well, if you had your whole life that it was like that, you have people that don't just ask the big philosophical questions they also ask the big religious questions which are often the same right why are we here how did we get here what happens when we die and so the spirituality develops during the neolithic period um, and so humans become more important in that obviously so um let me see what i want to stop at here um, you will need to know the three kinds of megaliths but i'm not going to stop at meg at them Maybe you can look at these yourself Okay, so I did tell you that it happened in four different river valley civilizations at the same time that that Neolithic agricultural revolution, in case you didn't know where they were, Tigris and Euphrates, <clears throat> Nile, Indus, and Yangtze. You probably don't, you might know where some of those are. If not, I have a, um, Mesopotamia is in, let me go back. Sorry. Mesopotamia is Iraq, like I told you, Iran, Iraq, Nile rivers in Egypt, Indus rivers in India. Uh, and the Yangtze River is in China, so that all happen in those same areas. Again, I'm going to just stop at the really important ones. So this I don't have written anywhere on this slide, so I hope I have it written somewhere else, but I don't know if I did or didn't. Katal Hoyuk. Oh, here you go. Katal Hoyuk. Katal Hoyuk. Um, is the oldest city in the world that we know of. That's the first city that was ever built. We do have some cave paintings, I'm sorry, cave paintings, wall paintings from houses because it got covered in volcano, much like Pompeii. Um, and so we'd have some of the cave, I keep saying cave paintings, some of the wall paintings from the, from the site itself. So I don't have it written down that it's the oldest city in the world, but I'm telling you so you'll get it right on the test. This might look familiar to any of you who are Star Wars fans. This is one of those places where Luke Skywalker was in the last set of the trilogy, the modern one, the Disney version. Okay, so this is the one I wanted to stop at, which is probably the most famous one I think that everybody knows from prehistory, which is, of course, Stonehenge. Stonehenge is a cromlech, which is a stone circle. Um, obviously, it's broken, so it's not in a complete circle anymore. Um, it was originally, obviously, meant for religious ceremonies, but it also tells time. Anything in a circle on the ground is a calendar, believe it or not. Now, it's not an exact calendar that this is going to tell me it's January 1st. And then it's, it's here, it's January 2nd, January 3rd, it's not that good. But what it does do as the sun, as the earth goes around the sun, right, um, the sun hits the earth in different spots, right? So when the sun rises in the fall, I'm going to make up, I'm making this up right now, from this line, which you can't see, to this line, as the sun is hitting this side of the thing, they would know it was fall. If the sun is hitting this quarter of the, if we cut it in four, the sun is hitting this quarter, it's winter. The sun is hitting this quarter, it's spring. The sun is hitting this quarter, it's summer. What Stonehenge does better than any of the other calendars, is it actually tells you the first day of summer and the first day of winter. So two exact dates. So December 21st and June 21st. This, it's, it, this is not a good angle. I don't know if I do have one, so I don't want to go forward. If I do have one, I'll show you it. But basically, on those two days... The sun lines up and goes exactly between these pillars and exactly into the middle of this pillar. So you know, oh, it's the beginning of summer. Oh, it's the beginning of winter. 
Um, I don't know. I was hoping I had a lined up picture. I do. Here you go. You can kind of see the sun coming up in the middle. It's not yet. It's a few days before winter. But once it's dead in the middle, it's the first day of winter. So I think that should be it for prehistory. That's the first part of our lecture. I'll record the other two as well, um, which is the ancient Near East and the uh, Egyptians. So this is the end of the first one.